Okay, folks, um, let's talk about the history of women in the 20th century, um, especially in Ireland. It's a, one of those new topics that didn't, um, wasn't on the Junior Cert history course, but is on the Junior Cycle history course. For me, it's one of the, one of the best sections in the whole course. And of course, if anybody from the department is out there listening, I'm sure you're not. The joke of it is that you won't be really given the chance in the exam to explore it in any detail because, you know, you're going to be given a document most of uh, and questions which, you know, they won't require you to have any real knowledge. And then you'll be asked to write a very simple answer, uh, probably to do with something to do with how, you know, women's lives have changed in some individual way across um, the hundred years of the 20th century. So let's go through this as quickly as we can. Okay. So this was um, written in the Irish Constitution, okay? This was the um, the state that was created following the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 1921 and its ratification in 1922. This was our this was our book of laws. This was our our, our laws said this: every person without distinction of sex, domiciled or living in the area of the Irish Free State. At the time of coming into of the coming into operation of this constitution, shall enjoy the privileges and be subject to the obligations of such citizenship. That was what our that was our one of our declarations. Our declarations when we became a state is that we would be a fair place, that we would be a place where there would not be discrimination based on gender, and boy oh boy oh boy did we fail to live up to that declaration in the years following independence. Very quickly, before we get into the specifics of, you know, um, 20th century Irish history, we have to understand a concept called suffrage. Okay, so suffrage is the right to vote. So we have in Ireland today, being the modern democracy that we are, we have something called universal suffrage, which basically means that anybody over the 18, age of 18 has the right to vote with very, very, very... Um, um, rare exceptions now in the early 20th century in the late 19th and early 20th century there was a campaign in kind of the western world i suppose is a good way of putting it in, in the united states and in britain but also in europe um for a woman's right to vote and that campaign is most famously embodied by the um uh, british activist emmeline pankhurst who led what were called the suffragettes. And the suffragettes were women who said, hold on, you can't treat us um, um, differently just because we are of a different sex. You can't discriminate against us because of our gender. And they fought for a long time for the right to vote for women. Now, in Ireland, we had our own suffragettes. Isabella Todd, Anna Haslam and Margaret, Curran, Mar Margaret Cousins, excuse me, were all very active in the uh, struggle for um, equality in Ireland pre-independence um, were part of the suffragette movement and were involved in organisations such as the Irish Women's Franchise League and the Dublin Women's Suffrage Association, both of which were organisations of women and some men who campaigned for the rights for women to vote the franchise is another term like suffrage for the right to vote so that's the early kind of 20th century stuff you also had women like rosie hackett after whom who's commemorated in dublin one of the few bridges in dublin I think the only bridge in dublin named after a woman is the rosie hackett bridge and louis bennett both of whom got involved in the trade union movement so they were kind of working class women who um looked at the way women were treated, working women were treated in domestic roles, but also in factories and saw that women were discriminated against because of their gender. Their working conditions were not the same as men's. Their pay were not the same as men's pay and who fought for equality in women's rights in the workplace. So, again, significant contribution made by those two women. Rosie Hackett, particularly lifelong um, contribution, notable and laudable 
contribution to um, equal rights in the workplace for all, including women. Now, by 1918, don't forget, 1918, Ireland is still part of the um, British Empire. And in 1918, following the First World War and the contribution that women made to Britain's ability to survive the trauma of the First World War, the British government passed the Representation of the People Act. And the Representation of the People Act essentially gave the right to vote to women. Again, it was limited. You know, they were limited by age and um, 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 status, but women got the right to vote and women got the right to stand for Parliament. And interestingly, the very first woman to be elected to the British Parliament was an Irish woman with a Polish name. She was born Constance Gore Booth. She married a Polish count called Count Markowitz. She's known to history as Countess Markowitz. And of course, she did never, she never took her seat in the British Parliament because she was a member of Sinn Féin. And in 1918, when Sinn Féin won their landslide victory, and you know this from your study of the 1918 election, when Sinn Féin won their landslide uh, victory in 1918, they refused to take their seat in the British Parliament and um, set up the doll in Dublin. Regardless of that, the election of Countess Markowitz as the first ever Member of Parliament was a very significant step forward in um, the story of women and their rights in the 20th century. In 1919, again, the British government introduced or um, changed the law uh, which had discriminated against women and introduced the Sex Disqualification Removal Act. And essentially what that meant that in certain uh, uh, professions, women were <laughs> unbelievably banned from participating simply because they were women. And one of the most important professions was the law. And we all know that power lies in the law. And Avril Deverell, an Irish woman, became the first Irish woman to practice at the Irish bar that's as a barrister in a court in front of a judge in the early 1920s, having trained to be a barrister following the Sex Disqualification Removal Act of 1919. So all, if you're ever asked to talk about moment, important moments in uh, the history of uh, women in the 20th century, you can talk about this, you can talk about this, and of course you can talk about uh, the, the prominent role played by women in the Irish Revolution. Often we think of the Irish Revolution as, you know, a man's um, revolution. We think about Michael Collins and Edmund de Valera and Patrick Pierce and, you know, all of the, 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 the notable male um, um, participants, you know, Cahill Brewer and so many more. But of course, there were very many women involved in the, um, the, the Republican movement. Coming to Mon was the uh, women's arm of... Uh, um, the Irish Volunteers uh, and you know some of the most notable women involved in the um, the Republican movement Winifred Carney, Carney Elizabeth O'Farrell very famously was there when uh, um, Pierce surrendered in 1916 Markowitz I've mentioned Kathleen Clark you know the wife of Tom Clark who went on to become a TD and a very uh, a, a vocal opponent of the treaty Kathleen Lynn and Helena Maloney these were these were you know, committed Republicans who participated in the struggle for independence and who were very vocal political commentators um, in the years after independence. I think, though, if you're going to study the history of women in um, Ireland in the 20th century, your focus should be on these two boxes. These are, if you learn what was in these two boxes, I think you're going to have you know, what you need to um, write about women in the 20th century. The fact is that Ireland did not treat women um, as equal citizens. The Irish state, when it became independent, did not treat women as equal citizens. It didn't. And, you know, there are loads of examples of it. The 1922 Local Government Act, which restricted women's right to vote. The 1935 ban on contraception. You know, men don't carry babies. Women carry babies. In 1935, 1934, contraception was legal in Ireland. 
1935 under pressure from the Catholic Church, which became so such a dominant part of um, Irish life following independence, contraception was banned, much to the detriment of women. In 1937, Article 41 of Bunrock the Heron, which was the constitution of the Irish state, which essentially made Ireland a republic in everything but name, stated in, in no uncertain terms that a woman's place was in the home. That a mother, that a woman's primary role in the state was to be a wife and a mother. Incredible. That was in our that was in our laws. It was part of our of our of our national constitution. In 1951, Dr. Noel Brown the Minister for Health and a, and a fundamentally decent man aware of the suffering of ordinary people saw how many women were, you know, suffering terribly from multiple pregnancies and the trauma of multiple pregnancies and saw that there was a, a dearth or a lack of good health care for women and their children, both pre and antenatal or sorry, anti and postnatal. And he tried to introduce um, a, a scheme which would have provided free health care for mothers who are pregnant and for mothers who've just had a child called the mother and child scheme and uh, it was shot down he was forced to resign the government uh, um, his colleagues in government did not support him the catholic church opposed him the irish medical organization opposed him and again this was a very significant defeat in um, the, the fight for women's rights and for the equal treatment of women in 1956, um, the marriage bar was introduced. It's known as the Civil Service Regulations Act. And essentially what that said was, if you work for the government in any form, other the only exception I think now, I'll happily be wrong on this, was primary school teaching because primary school teaching was such a, there was a lot of women working in primary school teaching so they couldn't really do it there. But essentially, the Civil Service Regulations Act said, if you're a woman and you are pregnant, and you are married, obviously, and pregnant, well, then you will be fired because your place is in the home. Our government fired women who were their employees because they said your job is to be at home minding your child. So again, you can see inequality. And something I didn't mention before was, of course, the network of Magdalene Laundries. that were in every county in Ireland and into which young women who were judged to be somehow, you know, morally deficient or questionable were um, locked up and uh, had their freedom taken away sometimes for a whole lifetime. If a young woman became pregnant outside of marriage, you know, these mother and child homes where the women were sent into them to have their babies, often the babies were adopted, you know, quasi-legally, uh, the women had their babies taken away from them and then they had their freedom taken away and they were forced to work in these laundries um, at the behest or the order of, of judges and with the approval of the states. So there is no doubt whatsoever that in many ways post-independence Ireland was not a friendly place for women. That changed slowly and one of the most important moments in that change was the... Um, sorry, was the, um, the, the Irish Women's Liberation Movement. The Irish Women's Liberation Movement were just this fantastic group of young women, including Nuala Fennell and Nell McCarthy, two women whose names we should all know, who issued this document called Chains or Change, which has to be one of the most important documents, you know, in 20th century Ireland. And it's a document that more people should read and know about because it gives you a, a, a picture of what life was like in Ireland not that long ago. And Change or Change is a primary source document that one can refer to when we're talking about the experiences of women in the 20th century. And essentially what it did was it demanded that women be treated fairly. The message was that women are in chains. That means restricted by unfair treatment. And they demanded the liberation or the freedom of women from these sexist and discriminatory laws. 
the Irish Women's Liberation Movement, for example, was instrumental in the organisation of what was known as the contraceptive train, which essentially means that they got the train from Dublin to Belfast and they bought contraceptions which were legal in Belfast but not down the road in Dublin and brought them back to Dublin and distributed them to women, which was a crime. But they did it because they were protesting against the nonsense of a law which absolutely, in a, in a daily reality in Ireland, caused, you know, undue suffering uh, to women uh, because it was sexist, misogynistic and unfair. We know that one of the things you might have to do is talk about some of the notable women of the 20th century. Mary O'Rourke, just one of my favourite people, absolutely love her, a highly intelligent, lovely woman, but also a tough politician, negotiator, very, very clever. She was a, a very prominent government minister in the 1980s. There are photographs of Mary O'Rourke you with know, all of the other ministers, and she was the only woman standing in the in the um, in the photograph. So, like you know, a really a groundbreaking, uh, um, fantastic politician and role model for women, as well as just a lovely person. Mary Robinson, who of course was the first female president of Ireland, elected in 1990. But I think more important than that, she was a barrister who went into the courts in the 1970s and fought um, campaigns for equal pay for women, for the end of the marriage bar, uh, for um, the legalisation of contraception. Just, again, one of those people who we need to recognise that we were lucky to have and who made Ireland a better place. And, of course, Susan Denham, who was the first um, president of the Supreme Court, female president of the Supreme Court, you know, if you want to ever, you know, pick a person who makes a nonsense of the idea that women are not, you know, somehow intrinsically equal to men, Susan Denham and her, you know, enormous brain and, high, and, and intelligence and the leadership that she showed as president of the Supreme Court is a good example of that. And of course, Dorothy Stafford Price, who I'd love you to do a little bit of research on, one of my personal heroes whose uh, work in, you know, healthcare in Dublin really made a massive difference uh, to the well-being of women of all ages um, in the 20th century. So there you go. There's a little video um, explaining some of the important elements of uh, the history of women in the 20th century. And as I say, if I was you, I would study the life out of those two boxes. And I think you'll get most of what you need for whatever question comes up in the exam.